I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 49th Gandhi Memorial Lecture that will be delivered by Dr. Balasubramaniam, a widely respected developmental activist and leadership trainer, thinker, and writer. As Josna mentioned, Dr. Balasubramaniam embodies a rare blend of grassroots and macro perspectives and policy through his multifaceted experience of more than three decades. He has worked in the you know, forest areas uh, of the southern Indian district of Mysore. At the tender age of, uh, or young age of 19, he founded the Swami Vivekanand Youth Movement and later also was the founder of the Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, a pol public policy think tank in India. So Dr. Balasubramaniam is the member human resources in the Capacity Building Commission of the Government of India. He's also a visiting professor at Cornell, USA, and IIT Delhi. He's a Tata Scholar, Mason Fellow of the Harvard Kennedy School, Fellow at the Hauser Center for Civil Society, Harvard University, Head and Visiting Professor of Vivekananda Chair, uh, University of Mysore. And he's also the chairman of the Social Stock Exchange Advisory Committee set up by SEBI. He was educated in Mysore, at, uh, did his MBBS at Mysore Medical College, MPhil in Hospital Man Administration and Health System Management at Bates Pilani. He did a master's in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School at uh, Harvard University. He's a regular columnist, so many of you would recognize him from his writings in many international dailies. And he has authored seven books, both in Kannada and English. Uh, let me join Dosna in saying, we are eagerly looking forward to what you have to say on this uh, memorable occasion of the Gandhi Memorial Lecture during our Platinum Jubilee year. Thank you so much for coming. Good evening. <clears throat> Normally, one doesn't feel nervous to speak, because speaking is possibly the easiest thing many of us can do. But looking at all the distinguished senior scientists of India sitting here today, uh, and being with people whom I admire, uh, words always find a reason to escape your brain, and then you're looking for words to put together. So I stand here, I just want to thank the director Tarun and the chairs of the trust, Srimati Josnaji, for inviting me here today. When I got the invitation from the director's office, the first question that came to me was, is it a spam? So why would Raman Research Institute invite somebody like me, who's, who sort of lost his way, went away to a forest, spent pretty much most of my adult life there, and then further lost his way and found his way into government now. And, and why would they? Then I asked my secretary, just make sure the email is actually from them. And I think she spoke to the EA of the director, and she re reconfirmed to me, I think you can confirm, she said. She sort of gave me the courage that it's a real email. And then it was a privilege, because uh, four values on which the Vivekananda Youth Movement has started. Uh, four prized and cherished values which I've tried to live as far as I could. It's always a challenge to live those values. Two which Swami Vivekananda gave. Uh, and he says the national ideals of India needs to be Tyaga and Seva. Tyaga not in the customary understanding of sacrifice. You know, some of the Sanskrit words cannot even find English equivalents. Tyaga in a much deeper sense, which I'll talk about later as I speak. And even Seva, very narrowly defined as service today. And I'll stick to the narrow definition with a wider meaning. And two which uh, the Mahatma gave us, Ahimsa and Satya. Combining the four and trying to live them as a lived experiment uh, is something which I, I wouldn't say successfully done, but I can say successfully attempted with its own enormously challenging circumstances, from getting beaten up to being arrested. I've had my fun 
price to pay for all that. But that's the price you pay when you believe in something so dearly that you want to live up to it. So my journey and why, why talk about science and spirituality in the world in which I come from, from the world of, if I can call it service. So as I was contemplating, what should I speak on? I want to start off with what actually inspired me to explore this, 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 this fascinating combination of what we see as something separate, but which I think the world has to wake up to the fact that the more we separate, the more we don't benefit from the integration of what can be a very powerful concept. It's something like, for human convenience, we keep separating it out. And uh, I, I remember many years ago, I was traveling in a train, and trains are fascinating places to be in Indian railways, the best places to be inside the train. Once you get into it, you're safe. And then uh, people sitting around you, India has got its own magic of uh, talking about everything that they want to talk. And casually, when they get to know you a little more, and so five minutes is enough in India to say, I know him enough to start talking. And if, if they have a daughter of marriageable age and they look like you have, you might have a son of equivalent age, then maybe the discussion gets a little deeper too. And if your castes align in our country, unfortunately, then it gets really deep. Now maybe political ideologies misalign, then it gets really hot also. So we have all this and the fun of cricket, the fun of movies, all that, a lot of talking happens. And finally, a question was asked to me, and this has been asked to possibly every one of us in different circumstances. What do you make for a living? And that's a very nice question to ask. And I think we ask all these young people today, what do you make, what, what do you do for a living? And it's very funny how the way question is framed. What do you do for a living? And I always used to, and that question was asked to me and I could not, I just did not know how to explain what I do for a living. Because life is completely different. And here I was who, who believed in what Swami Vivekananda said and he said the whole world is a gymnasium and life is an opportunity for you to exercise in that gymnasium. And so I thought that's what I was doing, having fun exercising. And when somebody asked and you can't tell him, if I tell him I'm a doctor, then he'll say, where are you practicing? And we also have this magical Indian audience thinking where if you say you're a doctor, they'll have all kinds of illnesses on the other side. You know, they'll say, they'll want to ask. <laughs> So, and half the time you won't know any answer for it anyway. So you're anyway lying. But still you pretend to know stuff. And so I didn't like all that. So you can't say I'm a doctor. So what would you say? Would you say I'm just living in a village? And that's also not attractive. If you were to say I'm living Gandhi's life, Gandhi has now become a very dicey word to use even. Like in college, I lived in a uh, stage of my life and say, well, Gandhi tara You know, that it was more a, Word, that sentence that was used to pull you down saying, don't act so very good. Huh? You've got to be a little crafty. You can't be good. So what do you say you do for a living? And I used to struggle. And people never, the fellows asking the question, sometimes I would trouble them and say, are you asking it from an economic sense? Are you asking it from a philosophical sense? I would confuse them so much that they stop talking to me. I've tried all this fun, but I'm bringing this up now because we rarely stop to ask ourselves, what do you do for a living? And if somebody were to ask us this question, it's very comforting for us to answer from the framework of an answer which the world expects and that's what we also know. And most of us define our answer or whatever we, are even, our thinking even today are defined from those frameworks from which we operate. We are all trained to operate in zones of competence. That we forget the joy and beauty of operating from zones of our incompetence. And that's real human creativity at its best. But we all love to say I'm a scientist. And okay, what are you? And the moment you say that, then people immediately have a very, oh, something that's difficult to achieve. Or if I were to say I'm a doctor, there are identities, and we all fall in love with our affirmations and identities that we just stick on to them. And so I finally realized the best answer to give social work more time. I'm doing social work. That's a very simple answer because then, and everybody says I'm doing social work today. It's a very nice answer because from a politician to a bureaucrat to everybody else is always serving society in some way or other. Everyone of us are. So you can always keep this answer for everybody. But that served for a long time to be my pet answer. But I started living that answer without knowing it. That became an identity. And after some time, you're expected to perform like a social worker. That's the very funny part of it. 
because I I even remember many years ago and uh, this I forget which movies. A few of my friends that come to my city from the forest and they told me this wonderful movie is playing. I went there and the movie theater. Some of the donors who were supporting us also come and they say, "What? You have come to a movie? As though if you're doing social work in a forest, you shouldn't watch a movie, right? So we stereotype people and put them in boxes so beautifully that we like to separate." So we, are, I think, as human beings, we are all trained to look at the comfort of separation rather than integration, and that's the only way we can gain an identity for ourselves. Because if you are thrown into the ocean, you have no identity. A river in a ocean has no identity for itself. But if you are a river, then you have some identity. You have a name. You can call yourself something. You're starting at some point, ending at some point. So we are like that. So when I said I'm doing social work, it was a very comforting answer, and I had friends. and if you ask them what they do they would say okay i'm a mathematician or i'm a physicist and we lock ourselves into that thinking into that world and we start labeling ourselves living by those affirmations that pretty soon we just become a stereotype of that word itself without even recognizing that there's something much deeper so my life started that way and this journey of looking at the oneness of everything that's possible started off with separating it out as a social worker and i remember what happened in 1987 i went into this forest and and this 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 incident is not a very pleasant incident for me to narrate but that's the incident which actually shaped the way my life took a turn and all this difficult questions that i keep asking of myself and people around me and it's a journey it's a journey that never stops it's not something like you can already say i've arrived at the destination i was all of 22 just graduated from the mysore medical college thought i'm the next albert schweitzer and then went into this forest and thought people will somehow reward me with a nobel prize soon for having given up a very prized career most of my classmates went to the us or to uk having done very well in my university ranking i thought i could have possibly chosen to do a masters i just gave up all that much to disappointment of my father and went away to the forest and once i reached the tribal areas i realized they didn't care a damn about who i was or what degree i carried suddenly i could understand the incident that victor frankl writes in his book man search for meaning you know standing in line uh, when the gestapo is actually scrutinizing people of who is a jew to be sent to the gas chambers and who could be used for working and every morning standing in line not knowing whether that n22 year old go, suddenly going to condemn you to death or just asking you to work and living that life every day he narrates about the man in front of him an n23 24 year old who's trying to argue with that another 22 year old nazi officer telling him you don't know i have two phd's i'm a scientist you just can't uh, take me to auschwitz and that young 22 year old said okay but what how can you prove that you're really a scientist with two phd's and that fellow takes it the two theses that he wrote for his phd and hands it over to the young officer and said this makes you a phd with two, two phd's with a science with a couple of phd's etc and then the fellow says yes it does make it and there's a big stove beside that typical the in the in the olden days when they had the stove like in the gandhi movie we see he just put both the phd's into it burns it down and said now what are you You don't have your PhDs, and most of us are like that. You know, we hold on to something. So I was holding on to this degree of medicine, which I thought I had, and I went into this forest. And the tribals didn't care anything about it. In fact, the joke circulating around, I learned it a little later, was that they're talking amongst themselves and said, "Most likely, this guy is not even an MBBS fellow. He must have failed his final year." And we have been told that they can take exams in six months. So he's just come here. He'll spend six months of his time here. and then once next exam comes he'll go away because we are trained in our country to always look at people with suspicion we never really look at people with you know this man could be genuine we always look for that hidden agendas today there's no agenda at all to look at that's a different issue but we are we are all primed to do that and so i was in that phase of my life where i thought i'm you know i must be great i've given up so much of my worldly life and coming to the forest and these guys don't even recognize me and there's that egoistic urge of a doctor who said why can't somebody fall sick and they need to fall so sick 
that they have to come rushing to me and I will save them and wave the magic wand and they'll all fall at my feet and say, hail God, you come to save us. It was never happening. Very disappointing when, you know, your affirmation is not validated every day by a sick person. Saying, thank you, doctor, for saving my son's life or my life. Feel very nice. Or when we discover something in our labs and we say the whole world or we get a Bhatnagar Award or a Nobel Prize. And sometimes I wonder what this all means to us. But then I'll come into that a little later. So this particular incident where I was hungry for somebody to fall sick and wondering why can't people fall sick? And they should fall so sick that they should think I made the difference. And I had a call. I got to know, I didn't even get a call. I got to know that one tribal colony called Sani Madanahadi, in the area where I lived in, the chieftain's name was given to the tribal colony. Sani Madaya was the chieftain and his daughter was pregnant. I thought, here is my magical moment. I can show that I am worthy of being a doctor. I can go deliver the chieftain's daughter. And then everybody will accept me. The chieftain will think I'm great and all the tribals will accept me. So in, 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 in high expectation, I go to this Sani Madana Hadi, it was at eight or five, seven or eight houses. And I checked on this young woman. I can't even call her a woman, a 14 year old child. And those days, uh, our tribal communities, they didn't have structured marriage. Now they've got mainstream so much, it's very tragic that they're all imitating any of us, our lives. Or the state forces them to imitate us. So they are now, uh, those days they just live together and they just call it kuda holding and they live together, the girl gets pregnant, she gets pregnant. And this 14 year old was pregnant. A child carrying a child. And I, and that's where I was ashamed of the science part of me. The service part of me said, wow, I can deliver this baby. The science part of me said, great, high risk pregnancy. 14 year old child pregnant. Now I can really prove I'm a doctor because if I can successfully navigate this 14 year old child through a labor, then I must be really good at my job. And therefore, all the science that I learned in medical school will help me out now and I can do something about it. It's embarrassing to say the story even now because the way we count on our intellectual ego to give us a validation of our work is something which I didn't appreciate at that time. But that's there for every one of us in our own ways. Whether cooking a good meal or to finding out something new in our labs to doing whatever we do. And for me, at that moment of time, all that mattered was I should deliver this baby. And then I'll be really, uh, you know, adored or admired for the great work I did. And I came back, uh, and I remember my professor of obstetrics teaching me, I, I learned from one of the greatest of those days, Professor Kaulgood. He had told me, as an obstetrician, you should do nothing, he said. He's one of the finest, uh, most wise men. He said, the, the greatest skill I can teach you and you tell all his students, is watchful expectancy, he would say. He said, nature has already wired the human being to do what it should do best. You are only an aid, you are not a replacement for nature. And he thought that the best thing you can do is watch. Watchful expectancy is the word. So I thought, okay, but watchful expectancy is nice when your professor is watching you. But in the forest at 6.30 in the evening, when it's an elephant, uh, the India's, uh, Asia's largest elephant corridor, the Project Tiger area, you don't want to be a meal for some evening animal. So you said, okay, I'll go back and come back tomorrow. And Professor Kaulgood had said, prime me grab the first, uh, the first labor for a woman, takes 24 hours. So I thought, anyway, textbook says 24 hours, I can come tomorrow and check on this girl. So I left back to the little place I was staying in, came back the next morning. I was, I was walking down and at the hand pump in a borewell on the way, a woman was taking water. Putama was her name. Putama was the aunt of this child, this, this girl called Medi. So Putama asked me, where are you going so early? Because early mornings, the elephants come back from the river. And so uh, people get trampled at that time. So she said, don't go now because you don't know. And she knew I'm an idiotic fellow from a city who would not know all these basic rules of nature. But she said, don't go now, go a little later. I thought I should, I said, no, 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 but I have to go attend on Medi. And she laughed and said, you don't have to go. The child was born last night. No, you know, such a disappointment. The only opportunity to prove that I'm a doctor suddenly taken away. And why can't that follow the textbook and come 24 hours later? Why should the baby come in eight hours or 10 hours that I thought was inappropriate? But then I was not willing to be disappointed. I said, somehow I have to prove I'm a doctor. How do I prove I'm a doctor? So I said, I remembered again, Professor Kaulgood, he said, the birth canal is one of the dirtiest in terms of bacteria and all that. 
and especially tribals when their hygiene levels are low, the child's eyes could get infected as it's getting born. So he said, go put some eye drops to these babies. And then those days we would get something called gentian violet. I don't even know if today's medical students would even know what gentian violet is. You would apply it on the umbilical stump. And I went there, I took some gentian violet, took some eye, gentesin eye drops and went to that Sani Madan Hari. I said, I have to prove I'm a doctor. I can't let go of this opportunity and then it's gone. So I stand, I still remember, this small little hut. I'm standing there. And in, it's a, in, in tribal society, you don't enter the tribal colony without the chieftain's permission. I had a father's permission, Sani Madan. Yeah? You don't enter the house without the lady's permission. So I'm standing at the do door of the hut and calling out to Eng Medi to come and show me the baby. No, I, I was able to hear her inside. I knew she was there. Her father had gone out to get firewood to boil water for washing the baby. I could hear the person inside, but she's just not responding. Two minutes, three minutes of negotiated uh, requests, nothing is happening. And then I said, what the hell? I've come all the way from the city. I've given up so much. My whole family is abroad and this child can't come out when I ask for it. And that anger built up, again, the usual sense of ego. And finally, I burst out and said, if you are not going to come out and show me the baby, I'm going to come into your house and see it anyway. And what Eng Medi screamed, uh, in a sense, shattered my life and changed it. She's burst out. That's when I heard her. She said, please don't come inside. In Canada, she said, please don't come inside. I have nothing to wear. This young 14-year-old had just one sari. And she had delivered her own child. And previous night, while delivering her own placenta, the whole sari was soiled with blood. And this young one had washed it herself, put it on the hut, roof, of, roof of the, uh, the grass roof of the hut, was waiting for the sun to come out and dry it. This is 1987, my friends, 40 years of so-called socio-economic and political freedom that we got. And, and 80, mile, 80 kilometers from Mysore, city of Mysore, if this country, which supposedly worships all the women as gods and goddesses, is not able to provide a decent sari to cover yourself up. A 14-year-old shouldn't have you know, got pregnant. A 14-year-old, if she had got pregnant, should have had care to ensure that it was properly handled. And a nation couldn't afford a sari to this child. I just couldn't take that episode. I said, this is not the life I chose to. It's very nice to be romantic and say, I'll go serve India, rural India. But in the harsh realities of rural India hit you for a person who's unprepared for it, having lived in Bangalore, very close from here, all my life, in a typical middle class environment, you had no idea what poverty was. You have no idea what life was. And this is a life, within three months of my going there, hit me and I just couldn't take it. I said, this is not the job I came here for. I'm just going back. I'll go join my sister or my brother abroad and write a check to some organization and clean up my soul, and that's it. But then when you read Swami Vivekananda, he says man is the maker of his own destiny. And he says the moment, the call that he gave, saying that I, I call every young man a traitor who having been educated at people's expense, pays not the least heed to them. So I felt if I let go now, I'm going to be a traitor that he called. If I stay on, I need to build the moral courage, but I don't seem to have it. Now, that is when the struggle, and I realized the separation within me, the medical science part of the separation, of looking at the disease and not as a person. The service part of it, looking at the person with the compassion, but, not, but denying the dignity that service is supposed to carry. I didn't understand that. I thought I can give, but in giving, you take away dignity, and we don't notice it. Charity is not a very pleasant thing. You know, we, all, we all talk about the poor. We all talk about the beggars at the signal lights. But try for a change begging something from somebody. And you'll realize how hard it is to negotiate your dignity away. And these poor do it every day. And they don't like it. They can't live that life. So on one side, the struggle of saying, should I serve? And what am I serving? And one side, how do I use the science I gained? for the benefit of mankind. And in the separation that my life was, I kept it in three separate boxes. It took me 40 years of traveling to recognize those boxes are artificial. The problem is because we don't know how to experience the oneness of life itself. 
you don't know how to integrate science, spirituality, and service. And I'm sure in your labs, in that moment of focus and concentration, what Mihaly calls as flow, or what Advaita calls as that experience of oneness, when you're discovering something, in that one moment, you are the science, you are the scientist, you are the discovery also. And that is the powerful experience of oneness. And you can never get that experience if science is a journey of personal accomplishment. Unless you realize that science is an instrument, as much as services, for that evolution of ourselves, which can prepare us for that experience of that oneness. So it's a journey which I just like to share with you. You know, there are a lot of nice slogans we write. We write the science of spirituality, and then we say spiritualizing science. But I think these are all very notional. My way of looking at it is looking at opportunities that we all get in our lives. Very rarely we get, up, get those opportunities. To use these powerful instruments, which gives us the opportunity to go beyond the titles we carry in our jobs. The, the academic publications that we narrate in conferences, or the degrees that we proudly show off, or the awards that we get. Transcend these distractions. I call them distractions, because sometimes we fall in love with them, that we think that's why we are doing all this for. If we can transcend these distractions, and actually ask ourselves the question, who am I and what am I doing here? What am I even doing in Raman Research Institute? And is it, is it really something which I'm doing for myself, for society, or something much deeper? Am I even transcending that notion? So can we use these opportunities? And the way Swami Vivekananda puts it, so beautiful, he gave such a simple narrative. He said, Atmano Mokshartam Jagathitayacha. And in that one statement, he captured that oneness that I'm trying to describe. He said, the very mandate of human existence, this gymnasium called life, is an opportunity for us to evolve ourselves for that inner discovery for too long. And I think we also promote it as a, as a country, as a world itself. We're falling in love with science, which is all about inquiry, questions, finding evidence, creating log using logic to build that evidence or to demonstrate repeatability of experiments and all that that we are all so passionate about it that we forget there's something else hidden much, much deeper that needs to be unpacked. And in that powerful way, he said that that evolution, that Atmano Mokshartam, he said can only happen by the hita to the Jagat. Whether you use science to create the Jagat Sitha or you use service to create the Jagat Sitha are opportunities that we all have. Like the Gita says, as many paths, as many people, so many paths. So if service is my path, science is your path, but it's only a path. It's a path for us to have that wonderful experience of oneness with society, with community, with people, with everything in this world. And that space of oneness is what I think is a privilege that we are all endowed with, for, for just for the fact that we can practice it. But it's hard work. So it's very easy for us to narrowly define ourselves, but to expand our thinking to appreciate <coughs> what is in store. So that's how my journey started. I started looking at people who truly serve. What does it mean to serve? And since I was in that space, I started off with that question. And, and, and again, uh, to me, all, all the little knowledge I've gained is either from some Indian scriptural wisdom or from um, Swami Vivekananda's writings on the Vedanta. And he says it so beautifully. He says, you know, don't stand on a pedestal and say, here, my poor man, take me your five cents. Because the moment you do it, you want to be seen on the pedestal. And you want to be the giver and you want to have a taker for that. Oneness can never be ex can never exist in separation of giving and taking. Oneness has to be neither the giver nor the taker, nor the giver nor the taker. It's a very difficult and it looks abstract, but you're all scientists. You're all expected to figure out the abstract. So he said, it's not by, you know, consider it a privilege that you have an opportunity to serve. And you're just being, an, that just, you're just the instrument of that service. Can we truly reflect that spirit in everything that we do? And living that every day is the only way you can experience that oneness that I'm talking about. And he spoke about it so beautifully. He said, don't think you're extraordinary. And I, it looked as though those statements were written for me. Most of the hospitals and schools that got built with the organization that I founded is all on the banks of the Kabini River. And so he writes, he says all, and the exact words he writes, I quote him, he says, all those hospitals you build, all the schools you construct, 
can get wiped away one, in one big floods or can crumble to dust in one earthquake. So don't think you are the doer. Consider yourself an instrument through which things are getting done. So we, and he also gives another example and the place. He says, well, gravitation existed even before Newton. Gravitation got defined maybe by Newton. But where was the idea of gravitation? Right? It was there. It was just that Newton was the instrument through which it got expressed. So just remember, you're all different ways in which things get expressed. And it's in a, in a world of science, it's difficult for me. And I'm sure you will not agree with me and it sounds very provocative. But can we truly do this bereft of the identity of I, not just the title itself? Can we truly do our work without the transactional expectation of I'll become chairman tomorrow, I'll become director tomorrow, or I'll be the president of this organization or whatever. Can we truly do it for seeking perfection in a moment of time rather than in desired outcomes? It's not easy. Can I just do my job with no, no worry of the consequence of the future? It's not easy for us to ask because in a world where you write proposals and take money and have to submit reports and research papers and all that, there are outcomes expected. But can we do that in the way Vivekananda said? He said, intense attachment amidst detachment. And intense detachment amidst all attachment is the real secret of work. And to me, that's the best way to experience it, the oneness that I'm talking about. So he said, can we be the instrument of what things get done? And he gives this example. He says, God, which created the cow, also created the calf. So God knows, and he also created the DNA in the cow to take care of the calf. So you don't think that you are expected to take care of his creation. He can take care of it. It's just that he's using you for all that. So the moment we surrender ourselves, the surrender is not an important, helpless surrender, but a surrender of, you know, an empowered, uh, how should I say, a, a, a surrender driven by faith and conviction that we are just that instrument through which things get done, whether it's science or service. I think that is the beginning of experiencing the spirituality that I'm talking about. So to me, spirituality was just a process of self-inquiry. And like Bhagavan Ramana Maharishi said, just asking the question, who am I? Why am I here? Why was I even invited to Ramana Research Institute? Can I just go with the flow, the Zen of the moment and say, okay, I'm going. And, and if it, I wasn't too well the last few days and I wasn't too sure I could come here and talk, but here I am. So if I had not come, I would not come. That's all. So can we just go with the flow without getting agitated of, oh, will people appreciate my talk? Will there be 300 people sitting and waiting to hear me? Can we transcend those pettiness and just do and share in that moment of time the joy that you have to do? So I think I, I can keep talking on all this, but my view is the power to experience that moment of time, that presence, if you can call it. It's a very inadequate way of explaining that. If you can tap into that super conscious presence that is there in every one of us, in that moment of time, I think that is the flow that Nihali describes it differently, Krishna describes it differently. It doesn't matter who describes it. It's easy to intellectualize when these people describe it, can, but can we experience it? So to me, this journey has been using these instruments, these paths, these tools, if you can call it that, as something which is validated by several people in the past. And you start with faith. So I started looking at people who are, like I said, the little part of the scientist in me can't die. So I started meeting people. I started meeting monks from different places. I started meeting monks from different denominations, from different religions, just talking to them, understanding what makes them tick. What are those qualities that are so unique to them? I started meeting scientists. I was hoping to see one uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan here, whom I have interacted a lot with in the last many years, and a lot of people. Just understanding from them, what makes them tick? What is it in them that is different? Or is there something special? Is there something that can we all learn from? And I identified seven or eight qualities in people who are trying their best. To, and it's all a journey. Nobody is perfect. I realize that. But everybody is sincere in the journey towards perfection. That's all I can say. So people who want to serve, people who are really devoted to science, and today being in a position that I am and working with a lot of science ministries and others, I interact with a lot of people. I have seen the, the, the most crudest outer expression of intellectual arrogance and ego, the point of absolute uh, bereft of that. And I wonder, and both are in government. It's fascinating to watch people in all levels, from the highest to the lowest. And, and it's, it's, it gives me the opportunity to look, learn, and observe. And what I found were the people who serve 
or people who work for science or people who are supposed to be devoted to the cause of spirituality and attaining moksha, a few qualities which I found as common. And I thought, and when I talked to them, I realized possibly that enjoyment of that expression of it or that experience of oneness sort of manifests in a, in, in a, if I can call it in a way in which we can receive it in those qualities. What I found fascinating all these people was a deep conviction in themselves in the faith that they had. Faith that this is the way to go for life. Faith that this is the way to understand myself. This is the way to discover myself. Because all science is suddenly seen as external. And for the first time Vivekananda spoke about not just controlling external nature through physical sciences, but learning to control internal nature and trying to ask these difficult questions of ourselves. And when I watched these people, they had such faith that if I follow this path, I can figure out and I can possibly evolve. And you can't ask them to give you a mathematical answer and say four plus eight, you'll get at this point of time. But just that path of the joy in which they're enjoying that faith and that unshakable faith in themselves. And the second, these people are ever hopeful. I never met any of them. Like I was looking at, sometimes I used to feel so hopeless. I saw, sit in the outpatient department, somebody comes with scabies, somebody comes with vitamin A deficiency, somebody comes with diarrhea. And those days, I treat the diarrhea, the fellow goes back, after 15 days is back with diarrhea again. I treat the child's scabies, and then those of you used to have benzyl benzoate, then ask him to apply and all that, and then... One month later, the child is back with scabies. You feel so frustrated and you feel so hopeless. I said, what can I do for these people? But then, that cannot keep you on that path. That hope that tomorrow will be better. Change will happen. That's something extraordinary. And that's when what Swami Vivekananda said struck me. That's when the real idea of seva hit me. He said, see, seva is not about recognition. Seva is not about change. Seva is not about making society better. Then what is seva about? And that's why he explains it so beautifully. He said, service is of three levels, he said. And at a mundane level, he said, start with the physical service, the sharirik seva, saving, serving the body, you run a hospital, or anathashram, and all that, and just old age homes. Just care for the body, human body. You have an opportunity to care, and we can do it. Picking up a piece of plastic on the street is seva too. For us, that's not seva. For seva is only when you join a Rotary Club or Alliance Club and donate a fan to a temple and every blade will have your name. And sometimes the fan should not run because the fan runs, you can't see your names. Right? If, if only if it is not running, you can see your read your names. And what use if your donation is not seen by everybody? And so, and that is not seva. So he said physical seva is only ways we can do it. Not using plastic is also physical seva. It's physical seva to Mother Earth. And we can in, 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 you know, think of it in so many ways. Second, he said, once you grow in this, he said, Baudhik Seva, awareness, knowledge, talking to people and making them more aware of stuff. And you can't, and you can't lose hope that they'll not change. Just be a, keep changing. Try talking to me. Our job in the Capacity Building Commission is build state capacity, close to you know, 20 million civil servants, and changing their mindset from Karmachari Bhav to Karma Yogi Bhav. What else can I do if I don't have faith and hope? Right? And that's the way to work. And that's the reality of life. So I, I realized that, and, and the way and the way Swamiji said, the last third level of service is an adhyatmic seva. For a long time, I misinterpreted it very narrowly and said, someday I'll be prepared and I can start doing spiritual service. And that's when it hit me. What Vivekananda possibly meant is not we doing any service to anybody. If we can do the physical and the intellectual service, bereft of the ownership of I, Bereft of the fact that I am the doer and saying that things are getting done through me, that is the greatest spiritual seva you can do to yourself. So, Adhyatmic seva happens to you and that is an opportunity to experience that oneness. So, he explained it so beautifully and, and this journey, what I have done or what was done, got done through me has been that journey of trying to unpack a bit of all this. And, and, and the way I see it, faith, hope, and the third element I saw in all these people, the monks I met and everybody, and it has been a great opportunity to meet some of the finest people. And that's what I, I've enjoyed my life. From a politician to a monk, you can see all kinds. This positivism. These people feel so eternally positive, looks like only oxytocin is running in their breads. They can never feel that anything will go wrong. He's a monk, he doesn't know where he'll get his next meal, but he's supremely confident God will find his food. 
and I took on the challenge. I said, if this man can believe God is find his food, why can't I also try that? Let God find my food for the next so many days. So in 2006 or eight, I just decided I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk from Ishti Kote where I was working to Bangalore. I walked 420 kilometers, and the only challenge I told myself is I will ask. I will not ask for food from anybody. I will not ask for a place to sleep. I'll just walk. If people give me food, I'll eat. Others, I'll. I'll, 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 I'll magnify it with the Gandhian view and say, I'll fast. I won't say I'm starving. But hunger can be a very good test. And you will not believe the joy I had in that uh, walk. I call it walk within, the greatest walk I've had. And I do it regularly now. So we walked 420 kilometers and stopped in Bangalore. There's not a single meal that was missed. People would come with, in villages with uh, paisa and sweets. And in one village, when I was a vegetarian, and they, would bring, they brought chicken biryani and said, you should eat. So the, the kind of love, affection that rural India can shower. And there were times when 400, 500 people were walking with me. And everybody would be fed. The village would simply stop everybody. And we would sleep in the schools. We would sleep in homes. We would live in villages where there were no toilets ever. But I'm giving this example not because it, I did it, it was done by us. It's just to say that the power of the human spirit, if you start trusting that higher order, which will take care of us. So Samarpan Bhav is not helplessness. It is such an enormous conviction that things will get addressed. And so that's what I saw in all these people. When they start experiencing that oneness, it's just not, it just, there's no dichotomy at all in their thinking. It will get addressed. The spirit of positivism they have. The enormous attitude of servant leadership that they express. That their life is for others. Whether they do it for science, whether they do it for as a monk, or whether they do it for... And today we have all kinds of monks, don't worry. The godmen and the so-called godmen and the empires that they built and all that. But the real monks I'm talking about, for whom this joy of oneness is more important than anything else in life. And just interacting with them and talking to them, just look at the kind of attitudes they bring. Where the seva for them, the servant and the spirit is not about serving at all. English has got a beautiful word called helping somebody and passing it on, right? And you drop a pen, I pick it up, I give it to you, you say thank you for helping me pick it up. And we say thank you. Try going away without saying thank you. And the other person, I'm sure if you ask him honestly, he'll say, what? It's a crude person. They didn't even thank me. I just picked up the pen for them. Right? The moment you get that thought, you're involved in a transaction. It's a transaction where you expect somebody to notice and thank you. Seva is not that. Seva is recognizing the divine spirit in the other and using it as an opportunity to worship that spirit. That, that divineness, that manifestation of divinity is what Vivekananda said is real religion in the other. Recognizing that divinity and using it and saying, this is my opportunity to celebrate the divinity in the other. If you can do it with that spirit, expecting nothing in return, except thankfulness for the opportunity to celebrate the divinity in other. That is seva. How do you capture it in one word in English? If you guys figure it out, let me know. And because it's a real struggle. So servant leadership is not just an expression. Though Robert Greenleaf is credited with discovering that word in 1930, Vivekananda actually used it in the 1890s when he was talking in the West. And this is what he meant. Can we really serve that spirit? And I found these people. And I found these people also enormously fearless. Our Vedas talk about abhihi, 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 fearlessness. Fearlessness is not about courage at all. Today we talk about enormously courageous people. No, fearlessness is the ability to transcend fear itself. And that's a very powerful Eastern thinking uh, that we are offered the world. And it's so beautiful. If there's a snake lying in this room in that corner and I'm afraid of snakes, I'm afraid to get out. Unfortunately, all the tea is being offered there. So I have to get out. But if I very confidently negotiate and come out and then all the others say, oh, you're very brave. The cobra was sleeping there, still you came out. No. But asking myself, what am I afraid of? Challenging my fears, challenging these notions of all that and transcending it and then living with it. That is the fearless I notice in all these people. There is no fear of tomorrow. There is no fear of failure. There is no fear of the uncertain. They just live in the present moment of time and the joy that they enjoy in their presence. is something wonderful. So to me, experiencing that is like if the moment you talk of science, spirituality, and service as three separate rivers, then you're granting them these identities of separateness. But if you can practice that science and that service with the spiritualized intent, then you'll suddenly realize once they join the ocean, there is no identity. 
whether it's called water there or water here, it's the same water everywhere. And can we, through all that we do, elevate ourselves and use this opportunity to not look at science as my achievement, my accomplishment, or services, I served somebody, I built a hospital, I built a school. To say things were done through me, it is the most powerful opportunity that was presented to me to elevate myself. And that is a real spirituality. And that's the last point I want to make. In all these people, I found an enormous practice of self-inquiry. They were not just inquiring about everything. So when an Einstein can inquire about the concept of relativity, he could also inquire about the concept of God and ask himself, what makes the world work? So these people practice in the spirit of self-inquiry. Who am I? Why am I? Why am I in this position? Why am I using science as an instrument? Why am I even talking to such people here? When you can start asking these fundamental questions, and you begin the journey of self-inquiry. So these are the people. And all the three people that I've been trying to observe and trying to cultivate in myself, this is enormous ability to be mindful and keep challenging themselves about why they're doing what they're doing it for. And asking them, am I really mindful about all this I narrated? And if I am, then every day I move towards that joy, that oneness, where there is no you, there is no me, there is no speaker, there is no listener. There's no spoken, there's no speech. And in that perfection of oneness, I'm sure someday consciousness will be unpacked. Science will also find answers to explain this in words we cannot understand, in a language that is translatable to ordinary lay people, where a spiritualist will also understand they are as much a scientist as a scientist will understand it as much spiritual in what he's doing. And the man who's serving will also understand they're all just different expressions. And humanity needs is integration. And what better place than such ideas to start from Raman Research Institute. Thank you. You're supposed to have questions or something? So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Balas Brahmanyam, for this uh, eye-opening and inspiring uh, talk. Um, now, with your permission, I open the floor for questions, please. Subramanian is a great help. He's very clear. He's opened the floor for questions. So there is no expectation of an answer. <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so uh, please uh, forgive me if it is a personal one, but at that age, what, what uh, induced you to take this uh, path? I mean, off the, you know, the usual track that we all take. I had no real intent or reason. It was an accident. So if I were to say, oh, I wanted to serve and discover, it's all rubbish, it's all lies. I just wanted to go abroad and I wanted to do computer science. I wanted to study in IIT, like any other young man of mine. Those days we had these Agarwal tutorials and brilliant tutorials. It would come in post. Unfortunately, IITs didn't take me, that's all. So I didn't qualify even. So I thought I can get into REC. And the year I had to, Join, that's when they said only the same state REC you can go. Earlier you could go to any REC. Then I'd go to Suratkal. And they had just introduced computer science. I was part of, of uh, I don't know if you all know, National College at uh, Nasimaya. He had a Bangalore Science Forum. And I used to attend that. And so he had brought us all to Indians of Science. And he showed those big, big boxes and all the, trrr, the tape printing out. And he said, these are computers. So we didn't know what it is, but we thought we should study it. The box was so big, we thought lovely. You know, we can deal with so many big boxes. So that's all I knew about computers, nothing more. And uh, I had 99.67% in PCM, so I thought I can get into REC Surat. But I was only one seat for general merit, 100% got it. So I was very disappointed. Wait list one, I know I'll never get it. So I went and took. Uh, the, those days there was no, uh, what do you call, all these uh, exams and all that. So you just took whatever was. I said BMS mechanical. So I just went and joined BMS college. But I was so badly ragged the first day. I never had courage to go back to college the second day. Very ordinary middle class family. You don't have money to go sit in a theater. You don't have courage to stay at home. You've got to do something. So second day, I actually went to the college. But at the college, now they posted a policeman at the gate. Because those days, there's no anti ragging law. And apparently the policeman had to be officially invited into the college by the principal if something happened. Until then he couldn't come. He had no, he had no, he couldn't enter the campus. So I thought ragging today is going to be 
bad enough for a policeman to be stationed. Definitely not for me. So I took a reverse turn, came back. On the way, the Ramakrishna Ashram in Basanguji, I thought, gates were open, let me spend some time here because if I go home right now, my mother will ask me what happened. If I go home in the afternoon, I can say, college has just started half day class. I thought, till afternoon, I'll stay here. So that one afternoon, I stayed there. Two afternoon, I stayed there. Third afternoon, I stayed there. The monks there started taking the doubt. This fellow simply comes in, sits and walks around. A lot of fruit trees. If you go to Ramakrishna Ashram, Bangalore, a lot of fruit trees. They must have thought, this fellow has come here. Some vagrant fellow has come here to steal mangoes or some all those fruits. So to show I'm very serious, I went and sat in the library. Nothing else. And the, near the gate itself. So I, the next two months were the best years of my life eventually. The complete works of Swami Vivekananda, those days I published in eight volumes. And I read everything. I never understood much, but I just read it. Uh, that changed my life. Especially two small books, His Call to the Nation and to the Youth of India, permanently left its mark. And the sentence is like I already said about calling every young man a traitor. The other place he says, uh, I do not believe in a god of religion which cannot wipe away the widow's tears or bring a piece of bread to the orphan's mouth. So to me, that god of religion appeared fascinating. At 17, I think everybody is a socialist. We think we can change the world, make everything equal. This idea was very powerful to me. I said, this is the god of religion I must discover. And I come home, I had a telegram saying, join Mysore Medical College in India. Now, we all apply, the, those middle class, you apply, take PCMB, apply for medicine, apply for engineering. That's all you do. I applied for engineering, I didn't, I had no idea of becoming a doctor. And so I, I believe that that was a divine signal that my life was destined for something else. I still believe that and I have the conviction that Vivekananda chose it for me. Let us go, I just go where the path takes. Thank you. Arun? So, uh, my question is, uh, why did you uh, uh, decided to go to the forest? Why didn't you start uh, in Bangalore itself? Again, like I said, you must grant me the enormous liberty of inexperience of 21. Mm -hmm. Right? And that age, you think only rural India is poor. Mm. At that age, you think only the forest needs you. The services are not available. So I just followed my heart and went. So it was no in intentional thinking or some great strategic vision or assessment of people. Today you have strategic assessments and then you decide. I had nothing. I just went, went, went where my heart led. That may not sound like a rational answer, but that's the truth. Yeah. So another thing is, uh, it seems to me that in the rural India, uh, whatever they are, uh, I mean, leading their life, uh, this is not sort of uh, vitiated by whatever this urban uh, uh, society. So is there anything wrong with our urban uh, way of thinking? It's a great question. So I'm not going to market my books. I would like you to read two of my books. One is called I, the Citizen. And the second is called Voices from the Grassroots. We urbanites are destroyed what little India has been. We could add powerful opportunities to learn from them. In a very mundane, secular way, if I were to say, we have destroyed what is the idea of sustainability itself. So to, I'll explain it a little more. Mm. Uh, we have lost our ability to trust community wisdom. We don't even have communities here. We, even neighbors are not communities now. That's all gone. And we think that our way of life, because we are getting into positions where we become the decision makers and we decide, we will decide for everybody else. We set the narrative for the nation's progress and development. We want them to imitate us. I think we need a little humility. So the, the biggest lesson that I would like to recommend to all my urban friends is be humble. You don't have answers. You are part of the problem. You are stuck in traffic complaining of traffic. You got to stop using the car and start walking. And for that, you have to look, look outside you. So to me, a little humility is in order, a little vulnerability is in order, a little appreciation of a better world outside is much, much, much necessary. That's from a sustainability perspective. But that's not true today. Today, we have managed to use technology. We call it democratization, right? What have we democratized? We have democratized all the negative things first, all the vices first and then the virtues. We have democratized pornography in rural India. We have democratized gaming and gambling in rural India. All that, all that we have democratized. So we have sort of leveled out now. 
So now today we live in a world that has nothing special to offer. I would not agree completely, but it's not too late. It's now time to sit back and I just stop with saying um, one small actual incident that happened. Many years ago, can, can I give you some water? There's super human being. So, Jain are a very special set of people who live. They, unfortunately, government calls them primitive and vulnerable tribal groups. I don't know what is primitive about them, but anyway. But these people, uh, there's a, a person called Masti, uh, chief ten, and I used to be very close to him. So one day I told him, I want to see how you catch honey. Jain was honey, and how do you catch honey? So he took me to get honey with him. He and his son and seven, five, six other elders were walking. Around five, six kilometers, we walked into the forest. In the forest, while walking along, they sing songs in their language. And I had no idea what they were. Because just initial days, I didn't even learn the dialect, so I didn't know much. They went to a tall tree, I still remember, a very tall rosewood tree on which the honey, the beehive was hanging. Masti's uh, son holds his sickle in his mouth and quickly climbs up the tree. You know, like, like that is gone, 40, 40 feet or so up there. And he just went up. And the bees are all going on the hive and all that. And I'm a little afraid. The first time I'm seeing that, just imagine the scenario. And two other people with Masti just opened their dirty towel like that. You know, and, standing in at the bottom. And I was waiting for this fellow. I knew that if they're waiting for the towel, something is going to fall from the top. This fellow just put his hand into the hive and pulled out something. The, the bees are all around his hand. He pulled out the queen and put it on his left hand like this. All the bees were made a hive in his hand immediately. And then he sliced the hive, the only the lower one third, a little juicy part of the honey, and most of the honey was on the top. Right, bottom is all pupa larvae and just that. It fell from there. He caught it here. And then he put his hand back into the thing, pulled out the queen, put it back there, all the went back to the hive. This got down. I was very perturbed. I could understand this thing. And so beautiful. Nothing had bitten him. He was happy. We started walking back. They're singing a different song now. After some time, I couldn't take it. I told Master, how stupid can you be? You climb up 40 feet. We walk 5 kilometers. We're going back 5 kilometers to get this much honey. The hive had something like 20 kilograms honey. You only take three, 2 kgs and then the remaining 18 is there. How, what are you? It doesn't make economic sense. That is urban thinking because everything is economic for us, right? He told me, and what he told me is the wisdom we need to gain. He said, Do you know what we, what a song we sang when we are coming? While coming, we said, We have to lead our lives like the honeybee, being open to everything around the earth, everything around, taking a little bit of everything that God has given us and putting it here and making it better. The pollen is not tasty, but the honey is. The nectar, you can't, how much nectar can you take? Put it all together. And then he said, the song is different now when you're walking. Now we are saying, please, honey God, forgive us. We did not want to take your honey, but we have no choice because our children need medicines. We, this is medicines for them. The wounds they apply, they also drink it as medicine. So we have left most of what you wanted there. You did all the hard work, but we still stole from you. But we have no choice. We had to steal from you. Forgive us for that. So I asked him, but you've taken all the honey. Anyway, you cut it. He said, no. They did the job. They deserve the honey. We are stealing. We are asking forgiveness. That's all we can do. We can't pay them, but you can ask forgiveness. That is sustainable development. What do you and I do today? Is I should get everything. It's all for me, for me, for me. For them, it was for everybody. So when me becomes them, when I becomes we, only then oneness is possible. That is what we need to learn from you. So I had a question uh, about, uh, so you mentioned that we should move forward without looking for validation of our, you know, sub, uh, what we are doing. Uh, but I mean, as scientists, we always want to have markers which tell you you're on the doing something, you know, like even if you're say, selflessly doing something like, uh, you know, uh, bringing education to the masses, you would like to know how many you have, you know. Uh, so do you mean it in a sense that while we are looking for validation, you should not uh, 
you should look at it impassionately. Is that what you are saying, or you should not have the process of validation at all? You should not be doing it to, for the process of validation. You don't do it only because society should validate what you did. Recognize you just do it. Validation will come. No, no. But you need to validate to yourself See, that you are do doing that. the That's right part thing. That's part of being a scientist. But you're yeah. not doing it for validation. I don't even I mean, know. What you're yeah, not, not for you're external not, you're not validation. Attached, you're, not, but you're, you're not falling in love with your validation. It just happens that, that way there's no ego there. There's still a responsibility of validation. You're a scientist. Yeah, exactly. You need empirical so. evidence. You need demonstrable proof. You do all that. It's part of your duty. But you're not doing it. And you don't neither get, if it's not validated, you don't lose sleep. If it is validated, you don't celebrate. Pleasure and pain, all of it, you take it in the same spirit. It's very difficult. What I'm saying, you know, I, I don't practice. I have mm. tried to practice, I can say. But you can't, you forget. It's nice when people say, great job, Balu. Such a wonderful mm. training you did. And somebody says, what sweet you gave. You just wasted our time. You feel bad. But transcending that and not giving the speech because people should appreciate you or not giving the speech thinking that, oh, people start saying my speech is bad, what will happen? Nobody will call me next time. Neither. I just do my, give my best. Give me 100% in that moment of time without doing it, worrying about what the future consequences is going to be. It's not the consequences are not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Consequences will happen and that's part of life. But not, not, not getting obsessed with the consequences, but getting obsessed with the process and the means and what you're doing. So be, be completely obsessed with the science. That's what I meant. Okay, thank you. I just want, uh, what is keeping you currently busy? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to trouble me and Professor Kiran Kumar decided that he has to throw the stones at me. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun trying to understand what drives a public servant to perform. Normally, we all have this stereotype saying that, you know, I, mean, I had the stereotype. I always believed that government is inefficient machine, which is of no consequence for ordinary people and it destroys opportunities for citizens and they should not even be there. That was a sad, uh, myopic vision of mine. It's completely wrong. I think uh, government is a very necessary instrument. In the world of public policy, the first thing we teach our students is possibly the most organized instrument of violence is the state. But despite all that, the state constantly aspires to keep mitigating that violence. That is the function of the state. And that's a and it's better than the anarchy we have if the state doesn't exist. So I have presently learned, and I'm happy to be corrected, that with all the constraints, with all the challenges, the system still operates. The country still performs. Look at all the institutions of excellence. They're all public institutions. If you really look at it in our country, whether it's IITs, IIMs, the ISROs, which you chaired, everything. And, and to me, it is because the system operates, the system still works. It's very easy to look at all the defects and keep criticizing it, but to look at what works without even disclosing it. And I give this example. I used to give this example in my own hospital. I had a young tribal boy whom I trained as an electrician. And eight or nine months into his job, I suddenly got complaints from the doctors, from the ad different administrators in different departments saying, that fellow is useless, he's arrogant because that boy joined me when he was eight years old. He just attached, adopted me. Uh, the other way around. So they thought I'm protecting him. But I was not. And he grew up in the system. So he was on, at the time, 25, 26 years, 27 years old. He kept on complaining to me. Then, and I, the complaint was the bulb in the operating room is not changed. The bulb in the bathroom was not changed the last one week and stuff like that. So my question to them was, how old is this hospital? They said nine years. So 365 years into nine, let's say 27, 28,000 days, uh, 2,800 days, how many days the bulb did not burn? They said, none of the days. Every day it burnt. And how many days it's not burning? One week. So why are you noticing it? Because it's not burning. But you would have really been appreciated if you had noticed it and it was actually working for 2,700 days. And if you had told him, thank you for making the light burn. So you lose the right to complain if you have not exercised the right to appreciate. I think we treat the public servants like that. Including me, I was like that. So we, because they never ask. We never say the system working. When the system breaks down, all of us fall on them like a ton of bricks. Media to public commentators and everybody. How many of us thank the bus driver when he drops us safely and say, thank you for bringing me safely. Let him drive badly. You'll hear all kinds of comments. Hey, Manel, help it badly. All, the, all kinds of comments, right? We never go. How many of us walk up to the Indian driver and say, thank you for bringing my train safely back to Bangalore? We don't. Or the air hostess, when you're, he says thank you. But how many of us will politely say thank you for your service? We think it's our damn job. We don't. So I think public servants 
I have realized today, uh, I don't know about other countries, but I know for India for sure, they are like any other pop part of, they're all part of the same pool of people. They're excellent people who would do their jobs, whether you are watching or not watching. They are a set of laggards who will never do the job, even if you're watching. And they are the friend sitters. If you're watching, they'll do a damn good job. If you're not watching, they'll join other friends. It's our job to inspire them to work. So today, our mandate is very simple. The Honorable Prime Minister expects us to, as a commission, to shift attitudes of people from a karmachari bab, from a salaried employee to a karma yogi. I have to work for this nation. Exactly what I described till now. Work with no expectation of a return. The second is to shift approaches. Because for too long administration in our country, the, we, we, were, we, have, we have received the residue of what the British left us. Good, bad, we never analyzed it. So we evolved into a rule-based thing. You go into office, they'll give you five rules why you can't do something. You've all experienced it. Maybe when Dr. Shailay was sitting on the other side, you would have told all the rules the same. Now we'll say, oh, these people are telling rules to me. It's all a question of place where you are. So now our, our job is to shift people from a rule-based thinking to a role-based approach. My role is to serve you. My role is to serve India. My role is to serve society. And therefore, I use the rules for that and transcend it. But not I'm not saying Prime Minister doesn't say break the rules. I use the rules to transcend it and play my role. And the last is to create a future-ready bureaucracy because India is growing. India is, it's really, it's, Amrit Kal is not a slogan. The, the vibrancy and energy in some of the government offices today to really make India reach that level is fascinating. But that doesn't happen without a bureaucracy which is committed to it, which has the tools. So our job is to provide the toolkit, provide them the abilities. So give them future, to be future ready, you've got to be a lifelong learner. And even a person like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said it so beautifully. He said, as long as I live, so long do I learn. Get that spirit into a bureaucracy. It's a very simple job, but it's fun. I understood, I, I do understand that the Swami Vivekananda Trust runs a lot of schools for children. I'm interested to know whether the education there imparts some of the wonderful ideas and thoughts that you have shared with us this evening. Uh, we actually, in, in the schools that we run, we, we actually say that you can't, you can't be taught anything. We believe that you can only create ecosystems of learning where the child immerses itself in these learning opportunities. And so we try to do that. As much as it learns uh, 3D printing in our tribal school, the lived experience is all these values. And where we get communities to come and share their knowledge, all of us keep interacting with them. It's a constant evolving process. Now, is it, am I happy with everything that results out of it? Obviously, you no. Know, then I, I would say, but. Can, will that demotivate me? No. Will the results motivate me? We have children right now in IIT Guwahati doing PhD to all kinds of places. We have doctors, we have veterinary scientists, all supported by the system of the Vivekananda Youth Movement. I believe that the true, sp true test will come maybe a decade later when these young men and women really respond to building a resurgent India in their own ways, wherever they are. Get, become great scientists, great doctors. The true test is going to take that much of time. And I only hope I'm alive and kicking to enjoy all of that. Uh, Prabhu, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for a nice talk. And I, my question is, how do we carry this idea to the future generation, younger people? How much of it needs to go into the education system or what way it can, the idea such as what we hear now? Uh, I wouldn't say you should worry about it. You just worry about you carrying it into your life. That's all we need. Each of us want to change the world. I don't think we should worry about it. The world's already there. It'll be there. You have had an opportunity to be born into this world. Use it wisely. Change yourself. Try to live this. And your circles of influence will automatically start absorbing it. That's the best you can do. I started off thinking I'll change the world. Today, I say, every day I get up and say, can I change myself? That's the best I can do. It's not easy. That's the most complex. And if I can do that, maybe two, three observing me will change. And maybe, I'm not doing it for them to observe me and change, but the only thing I can really sincerely and passionately focus on is evolving myself. So my, my only answer is, let's not worry about that. For too long, we want to institutionalize, we want to teach our children. First, teach yourself.
my answer might look a little candid, but that comes with the experience of believing all that and then now realizing that changing myself is a struggle by itself. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Sindhu Rai has a question for me. Yeah. It's nice to see friends all in the audience. <laughs> it's frightening also. Um, so just wanted to hear your uh, approach, even with all this um, philosophy, how do you navigate deepest of frustrations, barriers, walls in your current role in government? Yes. I am hitting some and you may help me. I think the moment you see them as a wall, then it becomes a wall. Just see that's part of the job description. The mo and that's why you're chosen. You're chosen because of some unique ability you have to jump over the wall or break down the wall. If you see it as a wall, then you're lost, you're given up. And you don't do it because you want to break down the wall. You do it because you stay focused on the work at the side. I keep telling people, it becomes a wall when only when you put yourself at the center. The wall disappears when the work comes into the center. So my job is not for me to do all this in capacity building commission. My job is to get it done, get the work done, and I do it. And it happens, it happens. It does not happen, it does not happen. So replacing, I think the I is the trouble. Then the wall also becomes a trouble. You just say focus, stay focused on the work at the center. It's an opportunity. It's a brilliant opportunity for you to navigate. And I see it as an extraordinary opportunity to write my next book. It's not an answer that will satisfy you, but try it, it works. It can be frustrating. I'm not, I'll never say I was not frustrated. Uh, for me, Delhi was a great experience. It still is. Navigating Delhi itself is 10 books. But uh, I, I had an option. I could either complain that this is what it is, or say it's an extraordinary opportunity to understand human behavior. It's an extraordinary opportunity for me to learn how to ensure that the power of energy that Delhi can throw up can be converted constructively for national good. I don't think I'll, I don't know whether I'll succeed. I don't care. But now I have a purpose for my life. <laughs>